what we've been talking about is like if you've ever looked at someone in life who has accomplished big things, somebody, you've, somebody that's accomplished something big and you just can't ever imagine what has been uh, focused on and, and driven them to get to that point. Like you look at it and it's just this monumental thing. Um, I want to tell you how you can achieve those things. And I want to tell you how you can find confidence, how you can find peace, how you can discover a, a deeper relationship with your Lord. This is where you start. Okay, in week one, we talked about focusing on one word. We talked about focusing on one word. If you haven't gotten your word yet, you need to, to continue to be in prayer and searching for that word. It's not too late. It's just because we've moved on in the, in the teaching doesn't mean that, that you are a failure by any means. I had someone come to me this week and they said, I don't know what my word is. I've, I've been setting aside time. I've been sitting back. I, don't, I have not discovered what my word is yet. And he's like, I just keep trying to come up with my own words. And I'm like, well, yeah, I did that too for a while. And, but it was just kind of like, I told him, I said, you're just going to know when that word comes to you. You're just going to know what that is. And so I want to encourage you to continue looking for that word because it's, it's super important for your focus this year. But in that week, we talked about small beginnings and sometimes being ashamed um, that we're starting out so small and seemingly pathetic. Every time I try to start working out, I feel pathetic. Are, are you with me in that? Anyone? You, you're like, I used to be able to lift 100 pounds, so I can only lift 25, you know. And you feel pathetic, and that, that keeps you away from the gym because you look at all these other people that, have been, that started out small and continued to grow, and you just look pathetic next to them and it just defeats your spirit but but i have to i always have to walk a mile before i can even think about running a mile right if i can't even walk a mile i can't run a mile but then last week we talked about getting a thought from your one word a truth that you can kind of center your mind on all year something that will become true for you but in every week that we talk which was this week and next week we're going to finish up next week you're going to hear this because it's so true. This statement, and it's at the top of your notes that were in your bulletin. It's often the small things that no one sees that result in the big things everyone wants. It's often the small things that everyone's, that, I'm sorry, that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. And so we apply it like this. Our thoughts oftentimes seem small and insignificant, right? Oftentimes, that's my own world. You don't, you don't get to see what I'm thinking in my head right now. Does that scare anybody? Yeah. Okay, I thought so. But you don't get to see what I'm thinking in my head right now. That's my land, right? That's like, that's like, that's like Curtis land, like a theme park, and you can ride roller coasters there. But you have your own world in there, and sometimes we think things, and, and we entertain thoughts, and we, we go into the playland in our own minds, and we entertain those things, and it's like, it's okay, it's just a thought, I'm not acting it out, right? It's like, if I think about lying, but I don't lie, I'm okay, I'm justified, right? That's called temptation. But sometimes I have thoughts that enter my mind that I go, where in the world did that come from? Right? Our thoughts seem small, but they reveal something so much bigger. It's been said that our thoughts influence our words. Our words influence our actions. Our actions become our habits. And our habits create our destiny. So it's the small things that impact our life in a very, very big way. Very big way. And so we talked about our thoughts last week. That video is online, and I've had some requests for CDs and stuff like that. If you've really enjoyed the series and you want to listen to it again or you want to give it to a friend, um, we'll make those for you. Just need a request from you, and it won't be any charge. Church will cover that. But, um, but this week we're going to be talking about the power of your words. And uh, this, is a good, this is a very good thing. We need to think about this because as I was preparing for this message this week, I was paying attention to people's words and my own words. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, I was trying to get an inventory of my own life, right? I wasn't trying to act on what I'm going to be speaking today, although after today I will. Um, but I wanted to see how I would just naturally react and I wanted to be able to take a, a, a good inventory of that. Because after we talk about this today, you might feel convicted and you might change the way you talk a little bit, at least for a little while. Um, and, uh, and it's important to kind of get a real sense of, of where you are because you can't, can't get to where you're going if you don't know where you are, right? Like I can put directions into Cedar Point. I have a theme park uh, theme today, apparently. But um, you can put directions into Cedar Point, but if you don't know where to start from, you can't, you can't get there, right? 
You know what roads to take. You could be in California. You could be in Italy. It doesn't matter. If you don't know how to start, you can't get there. So we have to kind of take this inventory. And so we're going to be talking about the power of our words. So think about this. Think about this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. Whenever God created the world, He did it with the spoken Word. Doesn't that give power? That's amazing. Words are incredibly powerful. In fact, in, uh, Solomon talked about our words in Proverbs 18.21. He said this. He said, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. There are not many other things that have the ability to, to give death and to give life, right? There are not, there, you have a sword and that can take life. You have medicine and that can give life. Although you can have certain medicine and if you overdose it, that can take life, right? But that's probably one of the only things in this world that has that kind of a power. But the tongue has the power of the death and life. And we use our words every single day. And they have the power of life and of death. So we can say that the words we speak are either life-giving or they're life-taking. We can give life with our words or we can take life with our words. And if you want the key thought for the day, this is it. If you want to change the life you have, you need to change the words you speak. If you want to change the life you have, you need to change the words that you speak. Amen? Amen. Huh. Fake it till you make it. It's kind of that concept, right? Heard about that before. Because small things and the words that we speak can make a big difference in the life that we live. If you have your Bibles with you, I would like, you, I would like to ask you to turn to James chapter 3. We're going to hang out there for, for a couple of minutes. And again, I'm kind of hopping around today, so I'm not going to give you every one. But um, James said this a long time before we ever started talking about it. Before we even start about small things, big difference, before that concept ever came about, James was the one who was talking about this. He's, this guy, James, he's, he's Jesus' brother. Okay? He's Jesus' brother. Now, some scholars believe that James is the best possible evidence in the divinity of Christ. Why do you think that is? Imagine your brother or sister saying, yeah, I'm the Son of God. I'm awesome. You're, you're nothing. You're just, a, you're just a human. You know? Can you imagine that? Like, if your brother or sister was like, yeah, I'm, I'm God. <laughs> I would look at my sister and go, shut up and sit down. Right? <laughs> just being honest, right? Because... There's no way I would look at my sibling and go, yeah, you're, you're God. Yeah, I believe that for a second, you know. Um, but, but James wholly believed this. Um, if James thought that Jesus was the Son of God, that's pretty good evidence, if you ask me. Right? They grew up together. They were together all the time. So in James 3, he's talking about how small things can make a big difference. And uh, in verse 3 of chapter 3, it says, If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they will obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So if we put bits into the mouth of horses, we guide their bodies. Such a small thing can move a big old horse with just a tiny bit in his mouth because small things can make a big difference. And then in verse 4, he says, Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Whether, whatever, wherever the will of the pilot directs. Small things make a big difference. So then James continues in this line of thinking, and he's talking about the power of our words, and he says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How a great forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So in other words, a well-crafted speech can move a crowd to do amazing and awesome things. And it can work the other way, causing extreme and total devastation. Because there's po the power of life and the power of death in the words that we speak. You can speak life-giving or life-taking words. For example, if you show me a marriage that is struggling, I can guarantee you, 
guarantee you that there are a lot of life-taking words being exchanged. But on the other hand, show me a marriage that's doing well, and I promise you, you will see an abundance of life-giving words. You take someone that, that you don't like to be around, they make you feel small and unimportant, a boss, a friend, a coworker, maybe even a church friend, and you will find an abundance of life-taking words. But if there's someone that you love to be around, they build you up. And what you're going to see is plenty, plenty of life-giving words. So Solomon has a lot to say on this topic in the book of Proverbs. He was the wisest man who ever lived, and he contrasted many times the difference between life-giving and life-taking words. And so in Proverbs 12, 18, he said, there is one whose rash words, what do they feel like? In this verse, they say, it says they feel like sword thrusts. There is one whose rash words feel like sword thrusts. I bet everyone in this room has felt the pain of life-taking words before, haven't you? You felt that dagger in the middle of your back before? That heart, it just stings you when someone says something? It's just like, oh. But if you keep reading, it says the tongue of the wise brings healing. The tongue of the wise brings healing. It's life-giving words. Someone can give you the right word at the right time, and you're like, that is exactly what I needed to hear. That's going to carry me on for the rest of the week. Thank you for that compliment. Thank you for that encouragement. Thank you for affirming me in my time of need here. It's life-giving. But then in Proverbs 15.4, Solomon says, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. A gentle tongue is like a tree of life. It's, it's life-giving. But on the other hand, a perverse tongue breaks the spirit. I don't know how many of you have ever had your spirit crushed by life-taking words, but I guarantee that almost everybody at some point has felt a life-taking word. It made you feel like you couldn't do anything. That stole the life from your soul. And just made you ask the question, what's the point? What am I even doing? What am I here for? I don't know. It can be as meaningless as when someone looks at you and says, did you get dressed in the dark? <laughs> I've had that happen before. <laughs> Thank God I have a wife that I can go, what do you think? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, and you're like, oh, I thought it looked good, right? You, like, not, not, not that you actually did get dressed in the dark, but you intentionally put the outfit together, and someone's just like, whoa. <laughs> you need to go to fashion school or something, but maybe... Maybe someone came up to you and said, why aren't you married at this age in your life? Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> heard that from some people. And, and you hopefully just think, shush, and get out of my face right now. <laughs> but they hurt you, right? I mean, that, that kind of stuff hurts. People think they're being funny. People think they're, they're actually like helping you in those times. But that hurts. That's, that's a negative thing. And it could be some, some, some I'm sorry, excuse me. Something so much more intentional. It could be, I can't stand you. I found someone else. You're pathetic. I never loved you to begin with. I wish you were more like so and so. Or I just wish you didn't exist. Life taking words pierce the, like a sword and they crush our spirit. But on the other hand, many of you have been blessed. By life-giving words. I'm so proud of you. You're the best person for the job. I'd, married you, I'd marry you again and again and again. You're a dream come true. I'm so thankful that God puts you in my life. And, and that just builds you up. It just makes you feel good. It, makes you, it affirms you. It encourages you. Those are life-giving words and they heal the soul. So a lot like what we did last week, I want you to examine where you're at in your words. 
So we're going to do what we're calling a word audit. And if you have a handout in your bulletin, if it's, it's in there. If you don't have a handout, look on somebody else's in front of you or whatever. But I would like you to look at this. Look at the words that you speak and ask yourself, am I speaking more life-giving words or more life-taking words to other people? And then, this is going to be where you go to your, your land and your mind. You have to ask yourself, and think about the words that you speak to yourself. Are they more life-giving or are they life-taking? So let's start with other people. In your bulletin insert, there's a 1 through 10. If you don't have a bulletin insert, imagine this in your mind. 1 through 10. And on, at the 1 side, there's life-taking words. And on, at the 10 side, there's life-giving words. If you speak more life-taking words, you didn't do a good job. Why is your room a mess? I can't stand that. You always leave the toilet lit up. You're pathetic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If that sounds like you, you should probably circle a lower number. If you speak more life-giving words, great job, I'm proud of you, you're the best. That was an awesome meal, I'm so glad I hired you. If you speak those kinds of words, then you need to circle a higher number on that scale. And this is important. I'd like you to please do this. Whether or not you're writing it down or you're doing it in your mind, think about that. Where are you at on the scale? Because if you don't have a sheet to write on, I just, I just want you to, to imagine this and kind of pick a number. Because remember, this might seem small, but it's often the small things that nobody notices that make the biggest difference, differences that everybody wants. So let's think about that. Now, if you got your number, I want you to move on to the words that you speak to yourself. Okay? You're going to mess this up. You're not good enough. Your life is always going to be bad. I'm so tired. I never get a break. Those are life-taking words that you're speaking to yourself in your mind. Sometimes you see these things on Facebook because some people's minds spill out onto the internet. But is that you? You know, Do you tell yourself more negative, focused thoughts and you beat yourself up? Do you, do you, do you take your own life away by the words that you speak to yourself in your own mind? If this is what your inner conversation sounds like, then you need to put a lower number. But if you say more life-giving words like, you know what? God is with me. God's going to bless me. I am so thankful for another day. This is going to happen. I can make it through this with Christ who gives me strength. That's resting on biblical promises, by the way. But if your inner conversation sounds more positive like this, I want you to put a higher number. Or think of a higher number in your mind on that scale of 1 to 10. Now, if you didn't put a 10 on both of these, then guess what that means? There's room for improvement. Yeah, there's room for improvement. Why? Because there's power in our words. There's power in our words. And if you want to change the life you have, you need to change the words that you speak. And if you make some small changes in the word you speak, then you'll make a big difference in the life that you have. Our words have the power of life and they have the power of death. So let me give you two very powerful rules about life-giving words. The first rule is this. If you can't say something helpful, skip it. Don't say it at all. Can't say something nice, don't say it at all. I know it sounds like mom, right? Or dad or, or teacher or something like that. I don't mean to sound like that, but I am unapologetic in telling you that because it is important. It is something that we need to live by. People today need to live by this rule. Amen? Yeah, because there's just so much negativity flying around. There's so many life taking words flying around. You do, you, somebody puts a video online and immediately they're fired because of something that they did wrong, right? You see all of these people being attacked because someone is slightly offended at something that has just happened. If you can't say something nice, skip it. Don't say it at all. In Ephesians 4.29, I'm going to be reading this one out of the NIV. The Apostle Paul said, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. There are so many things in this verse that we could pick apart. I want to mention, um, according, 
only say what is helpful for building up according to their needs. Sometimes we build other people up according to our needs, don't we? That's life taking. Sometimes we say unwholesome things as a means of criticism, trying to get them to correct the path that they're on. That is still life taking. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't get me wrong. There's times for reality check. There are times when people are being arrogant. uh, They're full of themselves, self-centered, that you've just got to kind of sit down and be real with them. But there is a life-giving way to sit down with people and help them. Amen? We've all been on the end of receiving criticism that is life-taking. And in our minds, we think, man, if you would have just approached me this way, it, I feel like it would have been a lot more beneficial, right? Right. So we need to think about that. that should, this verse should cause conviction in us, though, right? It should cause intense conviction. Do not let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. For some of you, if you just applied this one verse to your life, it would change everything about your life. It would change everything about your life. It would change everything about your marriage, your parenting, your work relationships, your friendships. Sometimes we do so much damage just because we choose not to shut our mouths when we had nothing good to say. And if you're looking at the person next to you, if you're elbowing your husband or your wife, stop it. (laughs) Because you need to hear this too. I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to your husband or your wife. They're getting it too. They're hearing the same things I'm saying. But you need to hear this as well. Because I don't think any one of us are innocent in this. Right? None of us are innocent and in, in able to give all life-giving words. If you can't say something helpful, skip it. Close your mouth. Just don't say anything. That's the first rule. That's very simple, direct. The second rule is if you think something good, say it. If you think something good, say it. Proverbs 16.24 says, Gracious words are like a honeycomb. I love this verse. Sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. I want to read that again. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Now, I want to point out, notice words are very important. And sometimes we skip over details when we, when we don't look at the words. But Solomon didn't say gracious thoughts are like a honeycomb. He said gracious words. He said gracious words. See, I can have a good thought about you. Right? And you can go up to me and be like, what are you doing? Thinking about you? That's a little weird, I admit, you know. (laughs) Well, so was my wife, but you know. That doesn't mean anything, right? Like, but if I set it free, like if I'm thinking, oh, you have a very nice shirt on, right? But I don't ever say that. Like, you don't don't receive anything from that. I just get to think that. Like, what a waste of a thought. Like, diet pop, it's kind of a waste of a liquid, right? Because there's nothing in it. Um, other than like aspartame that'll rot you from the inside out or something like that. Especially Diet Coke. I mean, come on, don't even get me started there. Um, but uh, <laughs> you see what that stuff can do? It like eats nails alive. I mean, come on. All right, anyway, sorry. <laughs> you guys got me off track again. Now I've lost my thought process and we're not there anymore. All right. I can think something about you. I can think you look nice. I can think that you did something wonderful. Like there's people that help us clean up after church that I'm so grateful for. But sometimes I don't. I just don't say it because I'm like, oh, they know I'm thankful, <laughs> right? <laughs> like some of you that stay up clean up. I want to hear it, right? I want to hear you that you're thankful because like I don't get paid to do this. I have to push my lunch back with family because of that. There are people that show up at church on Sunday morning that I try to make a point to to thank because they're here at 8.30 in the morning to get everything set up and ready to go. 
There are people in, in my life that do things for me, uh, namely my wife, that I don't always verbalize to her or to those people because she knows I'm thankful. That's what she signed up for, right? I'm not saying that's the right perspective. I'm saying that is my flawed man perspective, right? Yeah. Guys, are you with me? Don't raise your hand. But um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> He's not sitting next to his wife, so he can't. <laughs> no, but you get that, right? You, we have that issue. Sometimes I don't say something nice because I feel like, well, they don't, they don't really need it. They don't care. You know, like, like I'm going to sound silly if I say that. Um, there are certain thoughts that I have that I never set free. But if I set free the good words that I am thinking, they have the power to give life and to bless. If you set free the good thoughts that are in your mind, they have the power to give life and to bless. Because we are not typically moved to say something just average good. If it's something's amazing and it's like life-changing, we're like, we're ranting and we're raving about it to a restaurant that they've been to 50 times and comes out and goes, man, that was the best meal I've had. You've got to go there. You've got to check it out. Because we kind of assume that everybody already knows about it. Right? See, like, I experience this on a regular basis. Because you and your job, me and my job, we all have, we all have our critics, right? We have those people who come up and tell us exactly everything that you think that they think that is going wrong, Right? And then you have those people that are so encouraging. And then you have everybody in the middle who doesn't ever say a word. So you don't know if there's anything wrong, you don't know if there's anything right. And then some people like me are like, uh, you get confused and you get scared and you get all that weird insecurity junk going on, but that's, that's for God to handle, not you. And you deal with these things. Words are so powerful. They are so powerful. And good words have the power to give life because they're sweet. So when you think something good, send a text, post a comment, uh, uh, pick up the phone, give them a call, say the words, write a note. It doesn't matter what you do. Don't be fake about it. Don't just say good things so that people think that you're awesome and all that kind of stuff because that house of cards will fall down real fast. But be real about it if you think something good about someone say it make it a rule you want to change your relationships every time you think something good say it don't ever hold that blessing back don't ever hold that blessing back why rob anyone else from that blessing of giving them life why would you withhold that from someone and i'm speaking to me as much as i'm speaking to you today if you think something good, say it. And not just to other people. This has much to do with yourself too. And you might sound a little weird, I'm not going to lie, but this is a great practice to get into because if you think it, say it to yourself too. Like, you know what, I did a good job. That's not boastful. Boastful is when you stand up front here and say, I did a great job, Right? When you stand in front of your mirror in, at home and you think negative thoughts about yourself, you're stealing the life from your soul. But if you stand in front of the mirror and go, you know what, I don't look too bad today. I actually, I think I look good today. That's life-giving. And in our society, we've exchanged life-giving for arrogant, boastful, and egotistical. Thinking good about yourself is something healthy. Right? Right? God wants you to love yourself, right? He didn't make junk. I'm not sitting here saying, like, wallow in your awesomeness. That's not right either. But are you speaking life-taking or life-giving words to yourself? If you look at David in the Bible, there was a time that he was so worried that he was going to be stoned. He spoke life-giving words to himself. The text actually says, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I love that. He encouraged himself. Every now and then, I have to preach to myself, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I have to tell myself, God, you've, you've got this. You've got this today. You've you got to give me faith for this. I, I believe you're working through me, and in all things, you're going you're gonna to create glory in all things that are going on around me and everything that I've got my hand in. And whatever happens, it'll be for your glory. Whatever happens from here on out. So sometimes you've got to do that. You've got to, have, you've got to encourage yourself with, 
with words of encouragement and affirmation and, and doing that. But not just that you can do something, but that God can do it through you. See, that's the key between egotistical, boastful, and pride and encouragement, affirmation, and strength by God's power. Is that I can do this because I'm giving God the glory. I can do this because God's given me the ability to do this. Don't just speak good things to yourself. Encourage yourself in the things of the Lord. See, I've heard it said this way before, and I like it. If you want to see it, say it. All right? So uh, I've recently begun um, doing that in my prayers with God, praying for people. I will tell God what I want to see and what I know is consistent with His truth. I can't say, God, I want to see a brand new loaded Ford F250 4x4 in my garage when I get home from church today, right? <laughs> like, that would be a magic God. I don't know if that would be a, I don't know if that would be a good thing or not. But um, it would be a miracle, yeah? Yeah. Wouldn't have to worry about the snow anymore, right? Yeah. You can't do that. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. But you, but you could say, God, I believe that you want to bless my marriage. I believe that you want to bless my marriage. Because that is consistent with this teaching, right? You can speak good words to yourself in those times. That is so consistent with God's character and His truth. But, but you've got to say what you want to see. And check this out. Jesus said, if you speak to the mountain. He didn't say, if you talk about that mountain. If you think about that mountain. He said, if you speak to the mountain and have faith to see it removed, that it will be what? It will be removed. It will move out of the way. If you speak to it, it's going to move. And in Ezekiel, God said, prophesy to the dead bones. Speak to the dry bones. He didn't say talk about them. He didn't say think about them. He said speak to them. Prophesy to them. If you want to see it, say it. You say, God, I believe you're going to work in my life. God, by faith, I believe you're going to heal this person that I'm praying for. God, by faith, I believe you're going to help us get out of debt. If you want to see it, say it. In fact, let me give you a phrase that will likely change the way that you think and the way that you speak if you use it. I promise you'll see a difference. I promise it. Because if you want to change the world, if you want to change your world, change your words. If you want to make a big difference in the way that you live, make a small change in the words that you speak because there's power in our words. So every time that you speak, Make sure, immediately following whatever you say, you add these words to it. And they're at the bottom of your notes. And that's the way I want it. And that's the way I want it. Every time you speak, make sure you can say, with integrity, and that's the way I want it. For example, if you're talking about your marriage, and guess what you don't say? I'm so sick and tired of my marriage, it's probably going to end in divorce. And that's the way that I want it. See, that doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. See, I'm pathetic. I never make a difference. I never get a break. My life is always going to stink, and that's the way that I want it. No, that doesn't work either. Your words are so powerful if instead you have integrity and you say, you know, my marriage isn't going well right now, but I am going to surrender my heart to the Lord, and I'm going to love her as Christ loved the church. I believe that God is going to bring healing to my marriage because that's the way that I want it. If you add that phrase to everything, every single thing that you say, you're going to see a difference in the words that you speak. Your thoughts matter because they become your words. Your words matter because they become your actions. Your actions matter because they become your habits. And your habits matter because what you do repeatedly is who you become. And if you can make some small changes to the words that you speak, you can make a big difference in the life that you lived. In week one, I asked you to focus on one small thing. Have one word that will drive your upcoming year. Last week, we talked about having one thought that would drive your and direct your upcoming year. This week, I want to ask you about having one statement. One statement that you will say again and again and again and again that will drive this year. One small statement that can make a big difference in the way that you live. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. 
Can my thought be my statement? Yeah, it can, your thought. My thought is actually a, a verse. My word still. My, my verse that goes along with that thought is, be still and know that I am God. So that was my thought. Is That's something that I want to continue thinking. So my thought is also my statement, be still and know that I am God. And sometimes when I get frustrated, that thought has to turn into a statement. It can't just stay up here. I have to actually say it because my words have power, right? So we have to say those things. Sometimes I'm sitting at my desk and I'm so, I've got five projects sitting out in front of me and I just have to say what's most important. And because what's sometimes the thing that gets our, our attention the most is what's urgent, not important. And I have to sit back and say, be still and know that I'm God. This is what God wants me to do with my time. I'm going to set all this other stuff away and let God take care of it. See, that's how that works. Focus on one thing. What does God want you to change this year? It can't stay a thought. It has to become a statement. Not only do we think about things that are lovely, pure, admirable, excellent, but we also give life to it by taking our life-giving thoughts and making them life-giving words. It's the small things that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. So if you want to change the life that you have, change the words that you speak because the words that you speak are so powerful. They have the power of life and death. If we don't speak life-taking, life, I'm sorry. If we if we don't speak life-taking words to others, and we encourage instead others in the Lord, and we give them life by our words, if we think something that's not good, we're not, we're going to skip that. We're going to we're going to we're going to just bite it. We're not going to let it escape our mouths. We're going to take it captive. We're going to take every thought captive, especially every life-taking thought captive, and we're going to make it obedient to Christ. Amen? We're going to take those things, we're going to say, forget that, and we're going to exchange, give a life-giving word away to someone who needs it. We're not going to let unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might be a benefit to those who are listening. Why? Because our words matter. If you remember one thing today, remember that, that your words, they matter. If we make a small change in the words that we speak, it'll make big changes in the life that we live. If we want to change our world, we start by changing our words. And our words will glorify God, improve our relationships, and make us more like Christ because that's the way that we want it.